Hi there. My name is James Cullinan, and I come from a small town in Illinois. It's a little place about 300 miles south of the Upper Peninsula, but it is not what I'm here to talk about. My friend Declan Grogan has created a podcast called My Town, and lately, his streaming analytics haven't been great. He blames the fact that season one ended almost a full calendar year ago, which I think is ridiculous for reasons I'm not legally allowed to disclose right now. Therefore, I've created a YouTube video, the most popular form of entertainment, to showcase all that My Town has to offer. So please sit back, relax, as I take you around my friend's podcast. Hi there, you know who I am. I said it in the intro. You don't need, we don't need more explanation. All right, I'm here because of a little thing called My Town. My Town is a great podcast and you should absolutely listen to it. There's deep, deep lore to My Town and I'm here to excavate that lore. <laughs> My Town. Written, edited, and produced by Declan Grogan. My Town is a fictional, comedy podcast about a little town called Whopperton in the Upper Peninsula of, of Michigan. Episode 1 of Season 2 is already out, but all, all of these theories were made before it came out. I just didn't have the time to record it. I am in my town. I play a terror character called Tim, and it's the best character. However, I want to say to everybody that what, what I'm doing today, everything I'm presenting to you is as an audience member. I have no insider secrets. There's no insider trading going on here. It's just me and my theories, my information. So, with that, I'm going to take you through season one. Episode one is called Welcome to Whopperton. We meet our main character, our humble and reliable narrator, Tyler Bob. We didn't plan this out before. <laughs> main characters. Tyler He's voiced by Declan Grogan. He voices Tyler Bob. He wrote the show. He edited the show. He produced the show. Give the man some credit. They have a Patreon now. Donate to it. Some stuff about Tyler. He won most heart in his kindergarten class. He's 14, I said that. He's never left Walkerton. We learned at the beginning of this episode, Tyler is not allowed to talk to people. Usually. He's, this is his first time out in the world in eight to 12 months. Next, we meet Wapperton. Wapperton is a copper town. During the 2008 housing crisis, they sold their name, which was originally Silver River, to Burger King as a publicity stunt. So, in terms of timeline, we think this podcast takes place present day, but we at the very least know it takes place after 2008. The premise of each episode is that Tyler is, has a theme, and he's going to go around and take us on a tour of Wapperton. Each time we meet new people and we go to new places. It's very structured. So, during episode one, uh, episode one, we go to a variety of locations. First off, we go to the Wapperton History Museum, where we meet Ted Montgomery. He runs the History Museum. He tells us that his old ham radio has been making weird signals. That's something I want to put over here. Over here, what we're going to call Suspicious shit. There's some suspicious shit going on <laughs> around Lopperton. One of those is everyone's radios aren't working. Radios. Ted's radio isn't working. That's a take by the radios. Next, Tyler's talking to him. Tyler knows some things about Ted that he shouldn't know. Tyler knows that Ted owns three bars of gold. Shipwreck gold. Remember that. Ted Montgomery then gives us a quick history of the town. Some, some twins traveled to the area in the year 1840. How did they get there? They were led by their compasses, which all of a sudden, the compasses started to malfunction. Compasses. That's one mention of misleading compasses. Next, a man called John Markane came to this place with nine other men. They were all gay. They founded the town. It's not publicly known that they're gay, but Tyler knows that they're gay. Interesting, isn't it? Next. Quinn Montgomery 
is Ted Montgomery's grandfather. Quinn Montgomery founded the mine, the mine. Quinn Montgomery founded the mine, the copper mine, with his friend Sawyer Pierce in 1843. History. Quinn Montgomery and Sawyer Pierce founded the mine using money from Sawyer Pierce's old family heirloom. Tyler somehow knows that these two people then illegally blackmailed all the surrounding mining companies into giving up their mining businesses for free. Interesting, isn't it? Suspicious shit. Tyler knows stuff. He should know. Then we cut away and Tyler tells us that he cut, he cut out the rest of the tour because it is mostly about Ted Montgomery hating the Pierces. Hates Pierces. Second person we meet in episode one is Captain Burke. He's a great guy. He's banned from the 7-Eleven. Captain Burke. Captain Burke is a pirate. Tyler gives Bert a camera to entertain himself taking pictures because Captain Bert stands outside all day and he just watches people. So why not take pictures? Photography's fun. I like photography. Tyler gives him a camera. Bert then tells us about how he sits and he watches people all day, every day. He also asks us, At night time, do you think we're looking up or down at the stars? That doesn't really have anything to do with anything, but it's interesting. It will come back. So we're going to put something up here. Stars. Bert watches the street each and every day. Bert tells us that every day, Nancy, who lives across the street and runs a bakery, throws away 11 peanut and beetroot tarts at 3 p.m. every day. Nancy Tarts. Bert hypothesizes that this is because she makes a dozen of them, each one herself, nobody else buys them, and she throws them away every day. However, Tyler says that he knows for a fact that Nancy makes 13 beetroot tarts every day, a baker's dozen. So, if she's throwing away 11, she must be eating two of them. Interesting. Captain Burke tells us about the shopkeep at Margaret's Grocery across the street who sweeps all day, every day, outside the grocery store. Even though it's clean! And he says, oh, surely it must be clean by now. But he keeps sweeping. Tyler, notably, says he doesn't know anything about the sweeper. And he sounds nervous. Play the clip. And what about the sweeper? I don't know anything about him. I've never talked to him. Sweeper. After episode one, it's gonna get much less detailed. Tyler goes to his routine visit with Dr. Ramos. As he's on the way there, he mentions that there's a witch who lives in the woods that he will not go to see because he is scared of her. Important, remember that. He visits Dr. Ramos every two weeks. The Ramos walks in, Tyler knows that Dr. Ramos is nervous. Tyler knows stuff. Ramos was brought here four years ago because of Tyler. He tells us that he saw Tyler once and he requested to become his sole physician. Interesting, isn't it? Tyler gets regular cat scans. What's going on with him? Interesting, isn't it? Tyler then leaves the room. Ramos takes the microphone and starts talking to the audience directly. He says Tyler has a few oddities, but is mostly normal. He says Tyler has an ability to know stuff that you don't want him to know. It's like he can hear your secrets. He says, Tyler is a good kid, and please just leave him alone. Don't listen to the podcast. Leave him alone. Then, he says something very interesting. Play the clip. We don't need any more slip-ups. Too many people know as it is, and if she... Just, just stop listening. What slip-ups? Who is she? She. Episode 2, Vacation Destinations. Episode 2 begins with Tyler confessing to the audience directly that he does in fact have superpowers and he can't hear anyone's secrets. Whenever someone thinks of something they don't want him to know, he can hear it in his own mind. Anyways, he goes on with life as normal. First person we meet in episode 2 is Brett the lifeguard. He's a voluntary lifeguard, it's very creepy, we don't need to know that much about him. Second person we meet is Ranger Hoover. She works at the park. Ranger Hoover. She's not a main character, we don't need her name on there. But she works, she's guarding the park. She says the park, the park, the park slash tree is the most dangerous piece of land in Wapiton. She says that her radio always picks up weird signals in the forest. That's two for radio. She works by the tree because the big tree causes accidents all the time. Everyone in town has at least one accident caused by this tree. Also, this tree is apparently the tree that Sawyer Pierce founded the mine under using this family heirloom. Very interesting, isn't it? Tree, mine, connected. What? Then we meet the best character in the series. His name is Tim. He has two lines in this episode, and they were dubbed over. 
They were dubbed over. Recently, Declan re-uploaded the new new versions of the episodes, which had less compressed files, and he dubbed over Tim's lines. It, it used to be my voice, and he dubbed over it's Declan's voice. Go back and listen, it's Declan's voice, and I'm addressing this now, Declan. I'm addressing it now. At the end of this interaction with Ranger Hoover, someone comes up and interrupts. It is Todd Watterson. He's delivering a sandwich to Ranger Hoover. He is important. Todd Watterson. He says he hasn't seen Tyler in a while, and he'd love to hang out. Tyler says they used to hang out, but he sounds notably nervous. Very interesting. Play the clip! Man, I feel like we haven't talked in years. It's been a while. Todd Watterson's a good kid. Yeah, we used to hang out. Next up, we meet Johnny and Steve, the local bullies. Johnny, Steve. They say that they haven't seen Tyler in 8 to 12 months. They threaten to break Tyler's microphone in order to save it. He says a bunch of shit about them that he should not know. A bunch of secrets. He shares them with each other, and then they get really embarrassed, and it's awkward, and it runs away. He feels really, really bad about it. He tells us he's never used his power for evil before. This is the first time that he could not lose the microphone, because they sold... His dad sold the car to get this microphone. That's all they can afford at this point. It's really tragic. Next person we see again in episode two is our good old Captain Burke. He tells us that people are suspicious of him all the time. Suspicious. Suspicious. He also tells us that he has been using the camera a lot. Then he tells us a story about how he once lost in a fishing competition to Dan Norbury. We'll meet him later. About a sturgeon in a cave. Chief Cranston, the police chief of the town, comes and interrupts, tells us that they both need to go home because there is a curfew in act. Curfew in act because a delivery boy has gone missing. End episode two. No! More suspicious! More suspicious! There's a credits guy at the end of every episode, except episode 2 doesn't have a credits guy. I also think it's for a similar reason that Tim's lines got removed because it's nothing lore related, but I find it interesting, Declan. What did you do? Why'd you lose that audio file, Declan? Come on, amateur. Episode 3, Food and Friends. Episode 3 is a great episode. It starts off with my favorite bit in all of season 1, which is the hot dog vendor bit. I, I would play the clip, but you need to listen to the show. You need to listen to the show. Go listen to it yourself. Hot Dog Vendor Bit. Funniest fucking thing in the show. We also learn at the beginning of the episode that Todd Watterson is missing. He's the boy that went missing at the end of episode two. <gasps> also, I am changing the name of this column. Remember this. Because it's no longer just about episode one. This is just shit you need to remember. It's gonna come up a lot. First place we go is like the de sexual. It's a very funny bit. We don't need to know about it for the lore. Second place we go is Dan Norbury's hot fish. Dan's hot fish. It's the most popular food eatery in city center. Started in Dan's wife Barb accidentally spilled hot sauce on a halibut they were cooking, and then Dan's hot fish. Great place. In Tyler's conversation with Dan, he mentions that Bert was talking to him about a week ago, and Dan takes note of this. Dan aware of Bert. Dan also tells us that Todd Watterson is a very nice boy, and whenever his wife, Barb, Dan's wife, not Todd's, Todd's a child, he's 14, whenever his wife had to go make on deliveries, Todd Watterson would take the deliveries for her. Took deliveries for her. There's also a weird guy who orders hot greasy tuna. That's not an item on the menu, just hot greasy tuna. And he specifies, it's for eating. Which is kind of weird. Also, he doesn't blink the whole time that he's there. They, they, they take note of that. Who is he? Who is he? I'm not writing him down, but who is he? Next person we meet in episode 3 is Mrs. Nancy. She owns Nancy's Sweet Treats. They're known for their famous puppy shop. Nancy tells us that she only makes a dozen peanut... Nancy tells us that she only makes a dozen peanut and beetroot tarts every single day. But Tyler, who's supposed to know everything, said it was 13. Tyler noticeably reacts to this. Now, here's my question. Was Tyler wrong? Impossible. That means Miss Nancy is lying. Why is Miss Nancy lying about the amount of tarts that she makes? Play the clip. I see you sold a rhubarb peanut and beet tart. Oh no, those never sell. I only make a dozen because I like the smell. Are you okay? Um, yes. Nancy tells a story about how she opened her bakery when Theon Pierce, Theon Pierce, Sawyer's great-grandson, wanted her to cater his marriage. But the wedding didn't go through, but she opened up the bakery anyways. Theon Pierce, wedding, fail. Tyler knows that Nancy has a secret trapdoor in the back of her bakery. 
He's really interested in it. She very suspiciously avoids talking about it until she eventually tells us that Wilson Pierce, Wilson Pierce, Wilson Pierce, Wilson Pierce, the guy who currently runs the copper mine, pays her to use her cellar, but she doesn't know what for. Nancy Cellar. Tyler knows that she's telling the truth. As always, we end our episode with our favorite character, Captain Bird. But something goes awry. Treef Cranston, the police chief, arrives to search Captain Bird's boat. Dan Norbury is also there. They have a search warrant. She comes out. Bert is arrested for the kidnapping of Todd Watterson. Something is found in Bert's boat. What is found in Bert's boat? A photo of Todd, layout of Dan's hot fish, and bloody knives. Bert says the bloody knives were just for fishing, and the layout of Dan's was for a prank that he was planning to pull on by putting a fish in Dan's air vent. Dan had mentioned to the police that Bert was talking about Dan about a week ago. That's when Todd went missing. Dan mentioned this to the police. The police then got a search warrant for Bert's boat, and they arrested him for the kidnapping of Todd Watterson. End episode three. <sighs> episode four. Episode 4 is introduced as lucky number 4, but suspiciously, the only thing I know about 4 and luck is that 4 is unlucky in China. Weird. Tyler wants to have a fun episode because the other episodes have been bummer, bummers. We go to the movies. We meet Claire Glenda. Then we go on the Kosan boat tour with River Hendricks. She tells us that Todd went missing between the witch's house and the nice part of town. She also tells us that people are suspect of Captain Bird going off to that cave, the one that where he lost the sturgeon. You know, that one. Next, we get a cab. We meet the cab driver, Dave. He tells us that he used to work in the mine, but he thinks that place is cursed because the compasses never work down there. Compasses, suspicious shit. shit. He also tells us that his cab radio has been turning itself on for weeks. Radio, again. Then we go over and talk to Captain Bird. He's in prison. Tyler realizes that Todd must be still in the town because he went missing between the witch's house and the nice part of town. And no cars are missing and no trains have were, were taken. So therefore, Todd must still be in the town. He wasn't found in the woods, so he still has to be there. Tyler vows to go find Todd Watterson. Captain Bird can make a bet. If Tyler finds him, he wins Captain Bird's old first fishing pole. If Tyler doesn't find him, Tyler has to put a stinky fish in Dan's air conditioner. End episode four. Uh, uh, episode five. Uh. Tyler's with the week watching detective movies, so he's ready for his shit. He says that the OJ trial influenced Love on Top hitting the top of the charts in 2011. I can't prove that, but I needed to draw attention to it. He visits Chief Cranston at the police station. Irrelevant. He visits Mayor at the town hall. Irrelevant. He then goes to the local conspiracy theorist shed to visit Laura Thorne, the conspiracy theorist. She tells us that her radio has been picking up strange signals! They have a really nice talk, and Tyler tells her to go for a walk on the beach to relax. Tyler then goes to Fuchsia Coffee to talk to Bill Montgomery, son of Ted Montgomery. Bill tells us that Ted would never let them sell any of the three gold bars because it is a symbol of their family downfall. He also tells us that Wilson Pierce is raising the rent for everyone in City Center and that he, he owns everyone in the City Center except Burger King and Dan's Hot Fish. The witch comes up in conversation. Tyler says about the witch that he can't read her. Tyler can't get the witch's thoughts. Then, Tyler has a breakthrough. He has a theory. He thinks that Pierce kidnapped Todd to get at Dan because he doesn't own Dan, so he needs ransom from Dan. But Pierce meant to kidnap Barb. But Todd always took the deliveries for Barb. So Pierce meant to kidnap Barb when she was on her delivery, but he accidentally kidnapped Todd, and that's where we're at. So therefore, Tyler needs to investigate Pierce. End episode five. Episode six. Tyler needs to talk to Wilson Pierce. How does he do that? He needs to get at Wilson Pierce's son, James Pierce. James. He meets James Pierce, but he needs to tag along with him in order to eventually get to Wilson Pierce. So he tags along with James, Claire, Tim, and Jess. A bunch of 18-year-olds 
Tyler is a 14 year old, I want everyone to remember this, as they go out into the woods at night to drink. As they walk into the woods, Jess reminds Claire that the woods are on the right and the mines are on the left. Just remember that, I'm not writing it down. Tim, my best character, Tim here, Tim Radio, keeps switching to some weird channel. That's five radio references. Tyler learns that the seniors have been hanging out in the woods ever since the old Air Force base had became private land. Remember this. Air Force Base. Private. They all play two truths and a lie, and Tyler keeps wondering because he can hear lies. Tyler also then starts to drink with them. He gets so drunk that he says, Do you ever think we're looking down at the stars? He got that from Captain Burt. Two star references. Tyler drinks, and then Tyler figures out that when he is inebriated, he can't hear people. He cannot hear thoughts. Alcohol rots the brain. The gang that all play sardines, Tyler and Jess end up in the same place. They have a deep conversation. They become friends. Then they notice a creepy guy in the distance. They think it's Tim at first, but no, it ends up being Todd Watterson. Jess notices that there's something wrong with his eyes, and Todd screams when he sees them, and it is genuinely quite shaky. Play the clip. Todd, it's Tyler Bob. Don't come any closer! What's wrong with his eyes? What do you mean? His pupils, they're huge. Todd, we're here to help you. Don't come any closer! I don't want to go back! Before they can chase after Todd, Ranger Hoover comes in, uh, takes them all home because they're drunk. Tyler gets dropped off at the Pierce's house. House, he eventually meets Wilson Pierce, and he knows to read his thoughts, but he can't because he's drunk. Episode ends in sadness and disillusion. End episode six. Episode seven. Tyler starts off telling us he is hooked on something Wilson Pierce said in the end of the last episode. Wilson Pierce said to Tyler, with boys like you going missing in the woods, we wouldn't want blah 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 blah, you know, whatever. Uh. Tyler was hooked on this phrase because nobody knew that Todd Watterson was lost in the woods, so how did Wilson Pierce know he was missing in the woods? Also, what does he mean by boys like you? What does he mean by that? Suspicious shit. So, Tyler reserves to break into the Pierce's house, and he does so. We meet Jameson, the soup-obsessed kleptomaniac butler who hates the Pierce's. He helps Tyler break in and find some interesting stuff. He finds a map of the city center with Dan's hot fish circled in red pen. He also finds out that the copper mine is not doing well. They're in the red. He also finds out that the Watersons are behind on their rent to Pierce. In the midst of this conversation, Jameson the butler says that he has never heard of Queen Montgomery, only Sawyer Pierce. Remember this. The Pierce's come home. Wilson Pierce says, of course he did not kidnap Todd Watterson. Tyler knows he's telling the truth. Wilson Pierce is A-OK. -okay. He tells us he circled Dan's property to remind himself that he doesn't own it, and he's looking at the Watersons' rent to try to help them due to the tragedy that's going around on surrounding their son. It is also revealed that James wants to study finance. That's a plot point in season two. The Pierce's call the police. Chief Francis comes, takes Tyler away, and uh, in the conversation bringing his home, she really chews him out, puts him in his place. It's really hard to listen to. It's actually quite sad. But she also reveals that they got an anonymous tip of a hidden compartment in Bert's boat. In that hidden compartment, they found another bloody knife, except this one, they tested, and they found out that this knife was covered in Todd's blood. And Bert will be put on trial in one month at the end of the summer. End episode. <clears throat> episode 8. The Witch's House. Tyler's absolutely given up the search. Tyler has absolutely given up the search for Todd at this point. He is disheveled, like me, but he is demoralized and he is beaten down. He goes to visit Captain Burt, our dear friend Captain Burt, who tells him that he needs someone to get him out of his dumps, out of his dumps, out of the down from the dumps, get him, raise his spirits, and he suggests Madame Joanna, as he calls her Joe, or as the people of the town call her, the witch! Tyler goes to the witch's house. Her name is Jo, her name is Madame Jo. I know we will call her Jo or the witch or whatever I want in the moment. She knows him, and she's apparently been waiting to see him for a very long time. Throughout the entirety of the time we are at the witch's house, there's the constant tick of a grandfather clock in the background. Tyler enters the house, he notices that the house is covered wall to wall in calendars. Interesting, isn't it? Remember that. We don't have the other board. Just remember it. 
The witch has the same power as Tyler, but it comes in a different form. She cannot hear secrets, but she can go into people's memories. And she tells us about the very first time that this happened to her. This is a beautiful cinematic work. It's not cinematic, but it's, it's audio. But it's, it's really good. It's done with a lot of editing. Declan put a lot of work into it. And there's a whole lot of fucking backstory. So let's explain the witch. She tells us that the first time her power ever manifested was in kindergarten when her friend Amy was talking about her dad taking her to the park the day before. All of a sudden, Jo felt herself swept up and all of a sudden she was in Amy's memory. Now, this is important, she does not experience these memories through the person, through the eyes of the person that had them. She is her own person in the memory, she's watching it happen from her own perspective. Next, she's swept away to what seems to be another memory. She finds herself in an office, with Amy's dad sitting across from a wealthy man in a nice-looking suit. Swept away to another memory. She's in a dining room. There is a younger version of that well-dressed man sitting across from Sawyer Pierce. All of a sudden, she finds herself in the mines beneath Wapperton. She witnesses a miner break into a cabin, and a gust of wind flies out of it. Next, she finds herself on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean, as a woman is hugging her son goodbye. Next, she finds herself at that woman's wedding. Then she sees that woman's husband at his first job. Finally, she sees that husband's boss at his first day of school. From that, she says that things just kept on changing, growing older and more unfamiliar as the memories went on. And from that moment on, she's remembered every single day of her life. Now, let's look at this. She, she is here in kindergarten. She's talking to Amy. All of a sudden, she is in Amy's memory. Amy is at the park with her dad. Then all of a sudden, when we jump to the next memory, who's there? It's Amy's dad. Amy's dad is sitting across from a wealthy man. A wealthy man. We jump to the next memory, the dining room. Here we go. And there's the wealthy man. Except he's a boy, and he's sitting across from Sawyer Pierce. Sawyer Pierce. Next, we jump to a miner in a cavern. It doesn't say who, but according to this logic, there's only one person that it could possibly be. This miner in this cavern is Sawyer Pierce. Sawyer equals mining over. Remember that! Next, we're at the Atlantic Ocean. There's a woman and her son. I'm not sure about this one. I'm not sure. However, the only possible logic is that this miner must be the son. Mustn't they? Mustn't they? If we're following the rules that are clearly established of how the witch's memory magic works, then we go to that. We go from that woman to her wedding day. We, she's at the wedding. Who else is at the wedding? Probably her husband. <laughs> her husband, we go to her husband's first job. And then who's probably at that job? His boss. We go from his boss to his boss's first day at school. And older and more unfamiliar. But that is where the description tops. Stop. This is the lore of the witch's first, first time diving into someone's memories. Now this is what's interesting. I told you, remember that Sawyer is the miner. Also here, at the husband's first job, there's a weird tapping in the background, and that can't just be random. That has to indicate what the job is. I'm not sure what it is. Play the clip. Then with her husband at his first job. Do you hear that? You hear what I'm talking about? I don't even know what that might be. To indicate who this husband might be, tell us. Comment below. The one thing I find most interesting here is that according to the way I've set this up, Sawyer Pierce is in three memories in a row, which doesn't seem likely because it's always one person to one person to another person in the memory to their memory. And this doesn't seem like this would make sense, but it's only possible that the sun must be Sawyer Pierce or else there's a break in pattern. And we don't know what that means. However, who else is in this memory? The cavern. not sure. But what if instead of Sawyer Pierce being the through line here, Sawyer Pierce goes to the miner and then we go from the cavern to the ocean. I would like to clarify that I don't mean the connection is rocks. I mean not the ocean. The woman in the sun. What if the cavern is somehow connected to one of these people? Or to this story? To this family story? I'm not sure how. But what if Otherwise, it's a break in pattern, and that doesn't seem to make sense to me. Then, Tyler and the witch go on to have normal conversation. We learn that Tyler almost never keeps 
uh, almost never hear secrets from Captain Bird, and that's part of why he likes him so much. Captain Bird is a very honest man. The witch then tried to have a normal life. She first got a job working as an assistant to Theon Pierce, the great grandson of Sawyer Pierce. I would like to note here that uh, Joe says Theon Pierce is the grandson of Sawyer Pierce, but in episode three, Nancy said that Theon is the great uh, grandson of Sawyer Pierce. I'm gonna go with grandson because Joe says grandson a lot of times, but I think Declan just fucked up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Theon falls in love with Joe, and he then proposes to her using the only diamond that his grandfather, Sawyer, ever found in the mine. Theon, Theon proposes to Joe. Joe turns him down because she realizes that she can never be with anybody truly in the moment. Where have we heard this before? Nancy started her bakery when Theon Pierce was going to have a wedding and he wanted her to cater it. But then the wedding fell through. We learned about that in episode 3. This is episode 8. And we're just now learning why that wedding fell through. It is because Joe said no to him and then she became a recluse and she became the witch. Enter Samantha. Samantha is the only other person in the series that we know to also have the gift, the power. Samantha showed up at the witch's door many moons ago. She had the ability to, every time she touched someone, she felt their feelings. She felt their emotions. Her and the witch had the same gift that Tyler has. They worked together. The witch trained her to become stronger, stronger to increase her power, but she could never truly control it. Samantha eventually left Waberton to find greater hapsters. Remember that. The witch tells us that she has one very strange memory. A big, empty cave. Play the clip. It's a cave. A big, empty cavern underground where you can't see any light. But you know it's big because your voice echoes for miles. She inspires Tyler to keep looking for Todd in the woods because that's where Tyler saw him in the first place. So why wasn't he looking there? And she offers to train him in his power after all this is over. Tyler then begins his quest and he goes to recruit Johnny Whitman as the muscles for his adventure team to go save Todd. End episode 8. Episode 9. Tyler eventually recruits Johnny by making, by correcting their friendship, Johnny and Steve, that he fucked up earlier. Tyler promises Steve an episode all about him sometime in the future, and it's coming, and it's going to be called Steve's Spectacular Special. Tyler then enlists Jess as the tracker slash na navigator for the trip. There was something I didn't write down earlier, but it was that when the teens were going to the woods in episode 6, Jess made a comment to Claire saying, Hey, remember, the wood is on the left, and the mines are on the right. That is the only clue that we get that Jess is good at navigating the woods. That's it. I'm, I'm, very, I'm, I'm very sure there's nothing else. And, and, she, and she found Tyler in sardines pretty quick. That's it. <laughs> so Tyler recruits her to be the navigator for the team. <laughs> At the end of the episode, Tyler and the gang are leaving Bill Montgomery's coffee shop. As they're leaving, Ted Montgomery is walking on the way in. Ted goes to say something to Tyler, and Tyler says, Bill's in the kitchen. But Ted's like, oh, yeah, uh, I, was, I, I, was going, I was going to talk to Bill, thank you. And he, and he goes in. Ted also admits that John Marquine, the guy who came here with nine other men to, for, to found a town in Westgate, and Tyler says, I know. End episode nine. <laughs> episode ten. The search for Todd Watterson. I haven't said the title of any other episode except for episode one, but you get to know it. Tyler, Johnny, and Jess go into the woods to find Todd Watterson. Johnny's radio isn't working. They get lost for a while, but they eventually find their way when they recognize that they're near, near the old Air Force Base. Calumet. Fun fact, they say Calumet in, in season one because Declan didn't know how to pronounce the word. This is something he told me in confidence. <laughs> pronunciation is wrong. Right outside the Air Force Base, remember that, they see a man in all black dragging Todd Watterson through the woods. He drops a note that says, if you want him, follow me. They follow him to city center. The man enters Nancy's bakery, and he goes down the... Oh, I didn't write it down, did I? <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> I know it's somewhere. Trap door? Yeah, you wrote it somewhere. I don't think I did. Oh, yes, yes, go, go, go. Get back behind the camera. The man goes through Nancy's Trap door to the cellar! In the cellar, there is a hole in the wall. They follow him through the hole in the wall. 
and they reach a big, empty cavern. As they enter that cavern, the man in black with to Todd Waterson is revealed to be none other than Ted Montgomery. But he says that he found Todd in the woods. And he was not the one who originally took him. Uh, that goes under remember this. Ted, no kidnap. How do we know this is true? Because Tyler can hear secrets and he knows that this is true. He found Todd outside the Air Force base. He says Todd was probably just lost, but but what? Outside the Air Force base, that is recently private land. Remember that. In the tension of the moment, as, as Ted keeps talking, the cavern, the big, empty cavern, starts making noises. It starts making noises? Whoosh noises. That's interesting. Suspicious shit. And then Ted Montgomery tells us a story. It is the story of Wapperton's history. Quinn Montgomery and Sawyer Pierce founded the mine. Jess is confused. She's never heard about Quinn Montgomery. They don't teach about him in school. They founded the mine because their compasses malfunctioned, and Sawyer thought that was interesting. Or Quinn. Uh, no, no. Uh, Quinn thought that was interesting. Their compasses led directly to the tree, the mysterious accident tree in the park. So they founded their mine under that tree, and under that tree did they find the biggest mineral bay ever known to man. But that wasn't enough, not for Quinn. Quinn kept following his compass because it was still malfunctioning. And one day when Quinn was on a break, Sawyer Pierce finished the job and he, boom, he broke through into a cavern. And to, uh, according to Quinn Montgomery, who was at the under, other end of the cavern, wind rushed through the cavern. A miner in a cavern broke it open, and a gust of wind rushed through. This was what the witch was remembering two episodes ago, in episode 8. And all of a sudden, the compasses started working normal again. Whatever was malfunctioning, was causing the compasses malfunction, was gone. Something changed. Something happened. Quinn went to go investigate, and Sawyer was standing stock still, eyes bolting. Shocked. Sawyer Pierce starts to blackmail all the other mining companies in the area, getting them to sell their deeds for dirt cheap for almost nothing. This is something Tyler knew in episode one during the History Museum. He eventually then blackmailed his own employees and then eventually blackmailed Quinn and kicked him out of the mining industry that he himself founded with his best friend. But Sawyer wasn't too harsh. He left Quinn the remainder of the family heirloom that they used to found the mine. What was it? It was five bars of shipwreck gold. Something interesting Sarah behind the camera just pointed out. It is specifically called shipwreck gold. Over here we have something happening on the Atlantic Ocean. Don't say me by for some. Don't know what that is. That could be connected. But it's interesting. It's not just gold. It's shipwreck gold. Quinn used one of the five bars to buy a house for himself and, and an axe and, and a pickaxe. He started working in the mine. Then Ted eventually used another one of the bars to buy the History Museum, leaving three bars remaining. The mine eventually dried up, the pierces closed the mine, but they left a hidden entr entrance open in Nancy's cellar. Ted bribed her for a key and has been using it. But this whole time, the Montgomerys had a hatred for the pierces because there was something evil about Sawyer Pierce after that day in the big, empty cavern. He knew people's secrets. He blackmailed people with things he shouldn't have been able to know. And Ted always thought this was fake, except for this one day when he's going to talk to his son and Tyler says, Bill's in the kitchen. Ted hadn't even decided to go talk to Bill until just an hour or so before. How could Tyler have possibly known? And then he started putting pieces together. Tyler knows a bunch of things he doesn't know. Tyler has the Sawyer Pieces power that was found that day in the mine. The mine gave him the power, and now the power is within Tyler, and the mind has dried up. Tyler confesses to having this power. Ted can't believe it. He says, quote, I thought Todd here was the one my radio was talking about. Because Ted heard on his radio, radio, interesting, that someone, that someone was saying a boy who could read minds went missing in the woods. Who's sending that radio signal? Ted says that if Tyler gives back his power, then the mine will reflourish with minerals. Don't know how that's gonna work. <laughs> minerals don't just grow in the ground. Tyler wants to. He 
loves his town. He loves his town. But he can't do it because he does not know how to give the power back. Ted says that's bullshit. Ted lunges at him, attacks, radio static, and the episode ends very dramatically, and the, the mine shaft falls in. There's a there's a there's a cave-in. A cave-in happens. Something interesting about that. How? How is there a cave-in? They didn't do anything. No one hit a wall too hard. How is there a cave-in? Something about his power caused a cave-in. How is there a cave-in? How is there a cave-in? Something happened here when Ted lunged at the man who had the power from that cavern. Was the cave was the cave protecting him? The cave might have been protecting him. I don't know. But something unnatural caused this cave. There's no way it just happened naturally. And the episode ends. Episode 11. The last episode of season 1. Welcome back to Wapton. I'm saying that because episode 1 was called Welcome to Wapton, and I think that's a nice callback. Good job, Beckman. We learned that everyone is okay. We learned that everyone is okay. That's good. But Todd is hospitalized with a coma. Todd coma. No one can speak to him at this moment. Then, we go to the Captain Burke Apology Festival. A big fair thrown in honor of Captain Burke and saying sorry to him for imprisoning him and picking him for kidnapping him. Some things I want to point out here. First of all, Brett the lifeguard and Laura are now a couple now. How did that happen? Because after a stressful talk with Laura, Tyler told her to go for a walk on the beach. Brett is the lifeguard. I thought that was a nice time. That mystery solved. James Pierce and Wilson Pierce, father and son, have made up, and Wilson is teaching him finance. That's a good ending. We meet Captain Bird again. Captain Bird says he has no idea where the knife with Todd's blood came from. That it wasn't even his. It was, quote, some sort of surgical knife. Clearly planted. He doesn't know where it came from. He doesn't even own the goddamn thing. The mayor bring back, brings back the Silver River Fishing Tournament that's going to come back later. Tyler sees the witch again, and he says, No, I don't want you to train me. Uh, no thank you, ma'am. Please, no. He says, quote, something happened in that mine that, that scared him. What happened? I think the cave in. I think he knows that he caused this. I think he knows that his power caused this, and he's, fr he's afraid. Because the Madame Johanna can't control his power. They can only make it stronger, and I don't think he wants that. Also, it is notable that uh, Tyler and Sawyer Pierce have the exact same power. They can hear secrets. Madame Joanna and Samantha have different versions of the power. What is special about Tyler Bob that he has exactly the same gift as Sawyer Pierce himself? Tyler was drinking in the woods with people again, except he doesn't drink this time. His alcohol rots the bane. Steve, another 14-year-old, gets drunk. He says, do you ever think we're looking down at the stars? That's the third time that thing's been referenced. I don't think it means anything. But they say it a lot. I like it. It's a nice quote. Steve is drinking. He's 14. That's weird. Tyler and Jess have another sentimental conversation before she leaves for Chicago. She knows about his power now. She asks about it. He describes it in detail, and it is truly off-putting. He says it is something deep down inside him, but it feels like it's not supposed to be there. Ted Cliff. It's super upsetting. Well, well, it feels like a transplant. Like at a very young age, I was opened up and some new organ was put inside me. It's part of my body, and works with the rest of the organs, but there's this deep feeling on a molecular level that it's not supposed to be there. The episode ends with a cute conversation between Tyler and his parents, which in that conversation, Tyler's dad asks him to help fix the radio, which keeps playing static. Then we have what I call the true ending. Dr. Ramos, our master of ceremonies, speaks to us again. He breaks the fourth wall, and he says, I know you've been listening to this podcast, but thank God you think it's fake, you audience members, you dumb little audience members. I'm, I'm glad you're convinced this is fiction, because he thinks that Tyler could be in danger. And he says, play the clip. If what I've heard about Todd is true, then she might already know. And He says, if what I've heard about Todd is true, then she might already know. She! Who is she? The she that was referenced at the end of episode one. She's not brought up again the whole series, except this, the very end of the very last episode. Who is she? Dr. Ramos knows who she is, and she, he is clearly afraid of her. That is something that is important. Nurse Racket comes in and says that Todd is awake, and he keeps asking about Tyler. Dr. Ramos gets up and then leaves. You think the season's over, but no, we have the true true ending. A little spoiler tease at the end. 
we hear radio static. We hear radio static and the season ends with these three words coming over the radio. Charlie, Alpha, Lima. Charlie, Alpha, Lima. Some of you may recognize these words. It's from that, I don't know, military speak, whatever, uh, that, that people use. Each word is supposed to represent a letter, the first letter of the word. Charlie, Alpha, Lima. C-A-L. There's one thing in all of season one that is spelled C-A-L. Calumet. The Air Force Base. The Air Force Base. Charlie Alpha Lima. Those are the first three letters to Calumet. That is what the radio is spelling. I am certain of it. The radio clicks, turns off, end of season one. I would like to address, there's been a season one recap trailer made for season two. At the end of that season one recap trailer, it ends with that same radio static, except the voice continues spelling, spelling the letters, and it says, Charlie, Alpha, Lima, Lima, uh, Uniform, Mike, Echo, Tango. It says it. <laughs> in the season one recap, I was correct, and I didn't get this theory out in time because I didn't have time to record, but I thought of this before. I did, I did, I did, I did, and I knew it. I figured it out. I figured it out. Calumet. Calumet. It's this weird private Air Force base. Who's working there? And there, connected there, their name is sent over the radio. Of course, it's the Air Force base, they're sending out radio signals. They're what's causing the town's radios to be messed up. So something is going on there. May I remind you that Todd was found outside the private Air Force base by Ted. And we know that's true because Tyler knows that it's true. With that final clue, we end season one. There's some brief other stuff. Over the course of the year between season one and two, they released two so the bonus my time episodes. Episode 12 is called The White Whale, which is about the uh, Silver River fishing tournament that the mayor brings back during the Captain Bert Apology Festival. Uh, and Tyler and Bert go to the cave that was mentioned a lot. And Bert says, Oh, I, I, it drives me mad, Tyler! He can't catch the sturgeon. And he, he sits out in the cave so long, every single day. And he's starting to hear voices, Tyler! <laughs> so that's interesting. And there's just a moment in that episode where Tyler is alone in the cave, and it's very silent, but you can hear in the background of the audio a subtle whisper, Tyler. And he goes, what? Hello? And he says, hmm, guess you really do go crazy out here. That's it. Bit of lore. And then in episode 13, Bop, First Blood, uh, we, the only bit of lore that we learned is that Dr. Ramos has reduced Tyler's appointments to once every two weeks, to once a month, and he doesn't even show up to them anymore. He says that the nurse runs the appointment, and Ramos talks to Tyler's parents in private. Tyler also goes manic in this episode. He goes full Rambo over a snowball fight. It's one of the funniest episodes. You should absolutely listen to it. I really recommend it. And then we have the season one recap, and the biggest bit of lore from that is that Charlie, Alpha, Lima, Lima, Uniform, Mike, Echo, Tango. It's spelled out for us fully. Calumet! Which I knew was going to be the Air Force Base. The Air Force Base. That is somehow connected to all of this. So radios was saying that a boy who could read minds was, went missing in the woods. A boy who could read minds. But Tyler was missing in the woods. Todd was missing in the woods. I think the people at the Air Force Base took Todd. And now Dr. Ramos has Todd, and the season two episode one has come out, and there's another bit about Dr. Ramos where Todd's like, please let me leave. And Dr. Ramos says, no, you can't. She's still out there. She's still out there. Very interesting. We don't know about that. So who is she? Who is she? Some possibilities. Samantha? Maybe. Samantha's something I'm thinking of. Because Samantha apparently left, but now that we've learned that Samantha's power is inherently tied to the big, empty cavern, I have two questions. One, if you have the power and you leave Wapperton, do you retain the power, or does it go away? You've left the birthplace. Two, did she really leave Wapperton? We don't know. Joe said that she did, and maybe she believed that. But I don't know if this character would be introduced just to be thrown away. I don't know. Another thing. What is this? 
<laughs> what is this? I understand steps one through five. We got a little confusion here. Is this connection to the cavern? Who are these people? We know who those people are. We don't know who these people are. If you think you know, comment down below. Please listen for the ticks of the husband's job. That has to be a clue to something. It wouldn't be just thrown in randomly. Like, why would you just put ticks in there? I don't know. I think perhaps there's a connection here. This cavern. If this is the origin story of the cavern, if this, if the cavern connects us to this step, this is the origin story of the big empty cavern. That is the origin story of this whole power thing. That's where this all comes from. Um, I still, we still don't know who eats the other tart that Nancy makes. Does she eat two, or or, or, does, or does Ted eat one? Is that what we're supposed to imply that Ted comes in and eats one? We're looking forward to see the spectacular special. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Declan has also promised me an episode about Tim, so we should stop promising people episodes about characters. The compasses were going crazy because of whatever was in the big empty cavern. We don't know what there was nothing in there except the big gust of wind that gave the power. We don't know. Whose blood? We don't know whose blood, but there was a surgical knife on there. A surgical knife. Who is the only person that could be related to a surgical knife? Dr. Ramos. I don't think he's bad, but Dr. Ramos is very afraid of someone. She. The doctor came here specifically for Tyler. I don't think he, 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 I don't think he treats anyone else. He treats Todd now, but I don't think he treats anyone else. I don't think he knows anyone in this town. Barely anyone. There's a point made in episode one that he, he only came here recently. He doesn't know much about Robertson. So if he knows someone, who is it? Because it's not any of the townspeople that we've met. It's not in our course of characters. But I think she is connected to this surgical knife. Because if he knows someone, it's going to be someone medical. And someone medical has the surgical knife. Someone medical had taught. Someone medical could stab Todd, or just put some blood on the knife, and plant that in Bert's bus. Someone medical, she, had Todd, where to where was Todd found? Todd was found outside the Air Force Base. I think someone medical, I think she, had Todd in the Air Force Base. And like I said, I have, I have lines in season two, but Declan is very secretive. I don't know any of the context of my lines. None of this is used using insider knowledge. This is from me listening to season one alone. This is this is just my fucking crazy mind. The last thing I can mention there's the sweeper that Captain Burt doesn't know anything about and never talks and Tyler's really scared of. Who is that guy? I've talked to Mrs. Groveman about this. Declan's mom, she's suspicious of him too. Mrs. Groveman and I are coming for the sweeper. We're gonna figure out their background. And she also, I didn't check this, but Mrs. Groveman, who has listened to the the podcast far more than I specified that no one says a gender for the sweeper. The sweeper could be a she. So candidates for she, we have the sweeper, we have she, <laughs> the medical person, we have Samantha. Mrs. Grogan also suggested that it might be Madame Joanna because she's really nice. I think she is really nice. Mrs. Grogan thinks she's too nice. I think that's very interesting. You can watch season two, you can listen to season two, and you, if you, if you watch all this crazy stuff, you will not miss a thing in season two. You won't miss a thing because anything, if something comes up in season two that relates to season one that I did not cover here, I will be so shocked. This is every detail about the My Town universe. My Town Audiomatic Universe. Thank Thank you, thank you very much if you watched to the end of this. If you did, you're, you're as crazy as I am. I appreciate it. Let me know what you thought. Let me know if I missed anything. I will freak out if I missed anything. But let me know what you think, and let me know your theories, because there is deep lore to this stuff. And I think we're going to figure it out before Declan tells us what the answers are. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. I'm done. I'm done.